Well, good morning, everybody. What's heaven like? What's it like to be an angel? What's our life going to be like when we're resurrected as spirit beings? Have you ever thought about those questions? Are you looking forward to being a spirit being? Will it be exciting, fun, or just like more church, more like church, whatever that means? Let's face it, sometimes church is fun and exciting, the sermons are great and exciting, but sometimes, especially to our young people, maybe it's not always our, exci our, our idea of what exciting is. From time to time, I've come across people who've wondered out loud whether or not, they're, whether or not they really want to live forever or not, spirit being or not. This is often from sometimes older people who see life as a burden, a difficult thing. Perhaps they're in a lot of back pain or depression or just a bunch of bad stuff has happened to them in their lives, and they'd be just as happy to never wake up. Sometimes there are even young people in their late teens or early 20s who are battling depression and wonder why on earth they'd want to live forever. Yep, there are people like that out there. Maybe you've been like that from time to time. And I'll bet some of you hearing my voice, in fact, have been. Others, usually teenagers and young singles, or more often young people in general, get worried about the end of the world coming before they've had a chance to experience life. Well, come on, let's admit it, uh, before they've had a chance to experience sex, or having a family, having a career, or maybe owning their own fast cars and nice home. We can sometimes start feeling like, especially some of the young people do this, I think, that the coming of Christ is going to derail our hopes and dreams, keep us from having fun, freedom, and a chance to show what we can do and what we were looking forward to having when we became adults. God has a message of hope for you today, and I think what I've just voiced, if we were honest with ourselves, have been thoughts that various ones have had from time to time. But I hope there's a message of hope for you today. If you promise you'll listen to both parts, parts one and two of the sermon series, I know you're going to hear God speaking to you and making your future much more real to you, much more real. Even you older members hearing this, I just know you'll see your future in new light and feel young and empowered again. So I'm dedicating this sermon, especially though, to the young people in the church. God has opened the door to you to come to him too, and frankly, I see too many of our young people not getting the picture and leaving the church. Perhaps we haven't conveyed the greatness of our high calling, the fun of God's future, the excitement that lies ahead of us. We've had to have many sermons on enduring suffering, on how hard things are going to be in the years ahead. And we have had to have sermons on that, on what we have to sacrifice, on the life of being a sacrifice and giving up what we want of ourselves and living the holy righteous life that we sometimes perhaps don't focus on the other side enough especially for our younger listeners you know God loves young people God often decided to work with very young people to do his work and God can use you too if you're a 17 year old or a 12 year old or a 20 year old or an 8 year old if you accept his invitation to work with you Joseph in the Bible uh, must have been pretty young when he started having some dreams. He's a very young child, maybe a young, a young teenager. He was sent into captivity, probably around age 17, and remained faithful to God, and God used him powerfully, as you know. Esther was just a young damsel when God called her for the huge job of marrying this pagan king and saving the Jewish people. David was a mere youth when God anointed him as king, and then sometime after that, around age 17 or so, even when he killed Goliath. Samuel was only a young boy when God chose to speak to him. You can read the story in 1 Samuel 3. And to use him as a prophet. Jeremiah, by his own admission in Jeremiah chapter 1, was but a youth. And Timothy was so young when God began to work with him that Paul had to remind him to let no man despise your youth. So young people, God does use you. God can use you. God listens to you. And I'll prepare a whole sermon someday that will focus on all the young people and children God's used at various times in the Bible. I've often felt that when you children and teenagers pray, if you believe, God is hearing you strongly and powerfully and responding to your prayers. So here we go with this. What will life be like after we're born, literally, into the spirit world? Are you looking forward to it? Or are you somewhat 
Oh, hum, ambivalent, wait and see. Or are you perhaps even dreading living forever? I know there are people out there, because they've said so, who really wonder if they really want to live forever or not. And many feel that surely, that surely nothing could be as thrilling as the life that we could be experiencing now in this life. My wife has given birth to four children, and with each pregnancy we were very aware of human life growing inside her womb. At times she even had morning sickness, she could feel them kick and move. We even had the pleasure of seeing ultrasound pictures of our boys. Babies really do move around. And we have a book called The Secret Life of the Unborn Child. It's a fascinating book. It shows how unborn babies can hear and taste, feel on a limited basis at first, but then quite strongly as they get older in the womb. They suck their thumbs. They can curl themselves up. They can slowly even move about somewhat. Now imagine with me, if you will, as we get into this sermon, unborn twins talking to each other in the womb. Let's say they're ten, uh, I mean, uh, they're eight, eight months along and uh, just a few weeks away from birth. And yes, bear with me for a bit of folly for a minute. Let's call these unborn twins Brandon and Brittany. They've overheard mom and dad talking about them and the plans their parents have for them. And now let's listen in to the unborn twins' imaginary conversation reacting to what they just heard. Brandon starts it up. Hey, Britt, they're at it again. Listen to them. They're talking about us and about the time we'll be born. I wish Mom and Dad wouldn't rush things. I kind of like it in here. I have a lot I want to still do, you know. It's warm. It's comfortable. Cozy in here. I just heard Mom saying something about finding a jacket, whatever that is, because of the cold rain. What's rain? Brittany says, yeah, I was wondering the same thing. I don't want to be born either. I love sucking my thumb. In fact, I've got my somersault almost perfected. I can do it now in just about a couple hours. What could possibly be better out there in Dad and Mom's world? Brandon says, listen to him talk. Britt, what's work? And what's watching a Mariners game? Did you ever hear Dad's holler when someone uh, hit a what they call a home run, whatever that is? Anyway, surely life out there, when we're born, can't be anywhere near as good as we have it in here. Brittany replies, yeah, why are they so eager to see us born? I wish they wouldn't rush it either. If I had my choice, I'd stay in here forever. This is what real living's all about, Brandon. Don't they realize it? Nothing could be better than what we have now, surely. And Brandon ponders and says, tell me, Britt." Do you suppose there is real life after birth? Now that may sound ridiculous to you, but I think that there's a germ of depth in all of that too. We are being formed right now, getting ready for our full birth into the kingdom of God as spirit beings. And I'm trying to make a point here. That which is born of spirit is spirit, Jesus said in John 3. That's the real birth we have coming up. Some of us aren't as excited about it as we could be. And, and Jesus said no man can be in that kingdom unless he's born again. And Nicodemus understood what that meant. He said, can a man enter a womb a second time? Jesus didn't say, no, no, I don't mean that. But he goes on to say, yes, it is a real birth. If we could just understand the spirit life better, though. Now, I've never been a spirit being either. But just as surely as you and I sometimes wonder if we want that spirit life out there that to be a spirit being and don't really sometimes look forward to it especially young people or especially people who've had a rough life and, and kind of depressed uh, we're kind of like that unborn twin in there just wondering if he wants to be born but there is a significant amount the Bible tells us about it and I thought by sharing what the Bible says with you today in today's sermon and the next one we can look forward much more to the promises set before us. Somehow this physical world seems more real to us today when in fact the real world is the spirit world. This isn't the real world. It's the spirit world that's really much more real than this. We'll understand that someday. Somehow the physical seems more exciting perhaps than the thrills that lie ahead of us. We can even have joy for what's coming to us soon. You know, even Jesus, it says in Hebrews 12, verses 2 and 3, was able to endure the pain and shame of the cross. Why? For the joy, or I should say how, for the joy that was set before him. 
That's in Hebrews 12, verse 2 and 3. So let's learn about what lies ahead of us, and let's get some joy about what lies ahead of us. I'll start by citing 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 to 11. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 to 11. But as it is written, I hasn't seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Paul is saying here in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, that we don't even have a clue what lies ahead. But don't, at the same time, feel like we can't discuss it, because he goes on in verse 10 to say, but God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now, we have God's spirit, brethren. And so God has revealed it to us by his spirit, as it says in verse 10. Now, the apostle Paul was even allowed to go up to the third heaven in vision. It was so real, he didn't know if he was really there or if it was just a vision. You can read that in Second Corinthians 12. Now, Paul also, somewhere else, I think it's 1 Corinthians 13, says we only see dimly now, but soon enough it will be crystal clear. So that's what we're talking about today. What will life be like as a spirit being in the kingdom of God? Turn next to 1 John 3. 1 John 3. We need to understand what God is like, what spirit beings are like. That's why it's going to take a couple sermons to do it, so we have some idea of what lies ahead of us. And I, I just know angels might be laughing at me right now and others thinking he doesn't have a clue, but, but we can at least look at the verses that are there. And we are all, in a sense, like the twins, the unborn twins in the womb, trying to figure out what life is going to be like after birth, okay, as a birth as a full child being. That child's already in the family, as far as the family's concerned, but he's not yet fully born. So the same thing with us. First John 3, verses 1 to 3 says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called children of God. We are already called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. First John 3, verse 2, Beloved, now, now, we are children of God. I heard a man one time say that he didn't think we were children of God yet. Oh, yes, we are. Verse 2, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. We're going to be like Jesus Christ, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. If we're going to be in God's family, it's important to know what God is like and looks like, what powers and abilities he has, and even what other spirit beings have, so we have an idea of what's coming up ahead for us. A person who's simply human, flesh and blood human, cannot see God and live, as he is, that is, and live. Now, we shall be able to, it says right there in 1 John 3, 2, at the end of it, for we shall see him as he is, because we're going to be like him. We're, going to be, we're, we're becoming like him in character now, with Christ living in us. And then the end, the easiest part, is transforming our mortal bodies to immortal bodies. That's the easy part for God. When will we be made just like God is? I spend a little time on this because much of the premise of the sermon is that we will be spirit beings of the God kind. Now, many of you who may not be attending the Church of God groups uh, may not agree with that, that we're going to be of the God kind. But listen in and also listen to the sermon on uh, new creation and, and the mystery of the bride and uh, Christ and the bride. And that explains more detail in those series. The full details will have to be a separate sermon, but here's some highlights. Remember Jesus told the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4:24, John 4:24, God is spirit. Now, if we're going to be like him, it stands to reason we will also be spirit. It also says in John 3, 6, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, whoever is born of spirit, or that which is born of spirit, is spirit. So in the resurrection in the next life, you and I are going to be born again as spirit beings through the process that God has in mind, the process he started already. 
We are now, in fact, begotten anew, genau in the Greek, in God's family. My, my sermon titled New Creation fully goes into that. We receive God's very own seed, 1 Peter 1.23. His very own seed, which is his uh, spirit and his word giving us his very own nature, his very own spiritual, if you will, DNA. We're already called his sons and daughters. Now, Peter said in his sermon in Acts 2, at the end of the sermon, when he's calling people to repentance, and he's inviting them to be baptized, in Acts 2, verse 39, he ends his sermon by saying that these promises, this awesome future, was available not just to you adults hearing me, Peter was saying, but to your children, Acts 2, 39. Kids, teens, young people listening in, this is all about you as well. And what God has in mind. Now it's all about God and His purpose. But His purpose and, His, and, and what He has in mind includes you very, very much in the plan. You children and you young teenagers and you older teenagers and young people. It says, Acts 2.39. Why don't you read that where Peter's saying that to him. These promises are to you and to your children and to all whom God will call. Now, so this is very much about you, uh, children, teens, young people. We're, we're all in the same boat in this. God calls children through their parents sometimes. Considers you children as holy people. 1 Corinthians 7.14 says that. And you'll see that in the sermon that in the end, these holy purposes will be loads and loads of fun. Unfortunately, people like me and other grown-ups have done a poor job overall, I think, of getting the message across to our young people that God is fun. God is an awesome being to be around, and God's future for us is beyond our comprehension as much as it's beyond the comprehension of an unborn fetus to try to understand what life is going to be like when it's born. Probably even more difficult for us to go from flesh to spirit and try to understand it. But anyway, we're trying to do a better job of getting that message across because we really want you with us, you young people, when all this starts to wrap up. Most of you know that the change to spirit comes when we're resurrected. Flesh and blood, 1 Corinthians 15, cannot. Be turning there, please. 1 Corinthians 15, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, though we're already considered its citizens. And when we're resurrected, we'll have to change from mortal to immortal, from flesh to spirit. There are flesh bodies and there are spirit bodies. The kingdom of God is a spirit-born family of God, and the kingdom of God is not the millennium, though God's kingdom rules the thousand-year reign called the millennium when he returns. Those living in the millennium will benefit from the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of God is the spirit kingdom composed of born again into the spirit world, members of God's own family, the spirit world after the resurrection. So the kingdom of God will rule during the millennium. But I want you to think about this. The lion and the lamb of the millennium is not the kingdom of God itself. The lion and the lamb are flesh and blood. Is the motif of the lion and the lamb, in fact, an accurate symbol of the kingdom? It's okay to picture the millennium, but not the gospel of the kingdom of God, in which no flesh or blood a uh, lion or lamb could enter. Just a thought. Have you thought about that? And so sometimes we we, uh, we mix the two together. The millennium is being reigned by the kingdom of God, ruled by the kingdom of God, but it is not the kingdom of God. So let's read of our change in God's word. So please be turning to 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to read it this time from the New Living Translation because it's so clear in there. Uh, we've read it many, many times in the King James and the New King James. Sometimes though those are my favorite Bible studies, study Bibles, and I would never recommend reading from a modern translation for your main doctrinal studies. Um, it's once in a while it's good to read the translations and other studies just to see how else it can be put, maybe in the Amplified Version and other places, other translations. Now remember, this is talking about you, even if you're only 15 or, or if you're 85, trying to respond to your calling from God. 1 Corinthians 15, starting verse 40. There are bodies in the heavens, and there are bodies on earth. I'm reading out of a modern translation. The glory of the heavenly bodies is different from the beauty of the earthly bodies. The sun has one kind of glory, while the moon and stars each have another kind of glory. 
Even the stars differ from each other in their beauty and brightness. And by the way, that will be the same thing among spirit beings. When we're resurrected, some of us will have greater glory than others. And some will have less than others. Some of us will have less than others. When will we be made um, like God is? Okay, when will that all happen? Um, just a minute, I, 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 uh, I jumped ahead here. I jumped ahead here. Um, anyway, there are bodies on earth and so forth. So, um, verse 42. It is the same for the way for the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies which die and decay will be different when they're resurrected, for they will never die. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, 43. Our bodies now disappoint us, but when they're raised, they'll be full of glory. They're weak now, but when they're raised, they'll be full of power. They're natural human bodies now, but when they're raised, they'll be spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, so there are also spiritual bodies. The scripture tells us, and I'm reading verse 45 now, the first man, Adam, became a living person. But the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. And then I'm going to go on to say in verse 49, just as we are now like Adam, the man on earth, so we will someday be like Christ, the man from heaven. We're going to bear his image. Verse 50, what I'm saying, dear brothers and sisters, I'm quoting here still, 1 Corinthians 15, 50, is that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These perishable bodies of ours are not able to live forever. But let me tell you a wonderful secret that God has revealed to us. We won't all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blinking of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. When the trumpet sounds, that loud trumpet that will be heard... You know, when God blew his trumpet, folks, in Exodus 19, just as before he, as he was getting ready to give the Ten Commandments, you can read that, it was so loud that the Israelites begged Moses to have God stop it. It will happen in a moment, in the blinking of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, verse 52, the Christians who have died will be raised with transformed bodies. And when we who are living will be transformed so that we will never die. Our perishable earthly bodies must be transformed into heavenly bodies that will never die. Okay, so I end the quote. There you, there you have it. That's 1 Corinthians 15, verses 40 to 53. If you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, if you have aches and pains, if you have chronic illness, if you're tired of getting old, if you're tired of being tired and getting tired, then it's time we get tired of this flesh and long for the new powerful spirit bodies you and I are going to be changed into, you teenagers as well, if you will go this way and accept the calling God's given you and receive his Holy Spirit, when he returns, you too could be changed to spirit beings that are just going to be awesome as you'll see. When we see a caterpillar transformed into a beautiful butterfly, we can marvel at the transformation from a mere worm into a thing of such beauty. But that is just a tiny picture of how dramatic our change will be when we're changed from mere mortal to the radiant spirits we will be. We'll be as different then as a butterfly is from the caterpillar that it once was. We can stand in awe at what this is saying, like an unborn fetus in the womb. We have just an inkling of what God has in store for each of us. 1 Timothy 1.17 says that our king is eternal, immortal, invisible. How would you like to be an invisible person who could appear and, re and disappear? Kids, this is going to be fun. Young people, this is going to be fun. There was, there was a movie many years ago called The Invisible Man. John 3 verse 8, Jesus speaking, John 3 8 said, Spirit beings are just like the wind. Invisible, yet you see their power. Powerful beings. First Corinthians, uh, First Colossians, one fifteen. First, um, First Colossians, only one Colossians. Colossians one fifteen says Jesus is the perfect image of the invisible God, the invisible God. So you got to start thinking about this being invisible to the human eye. That's going to be a new concept for you and me when when we be, when we get to be changed. And yet apparently when spirit beings like angels choose to reveal themselves to humans, they can be very visible. You can see them uh, wherever you are right now because God in heaven has chosen you and is working with you. 
there has to be at least one, I would think, at least one, maybe many, many more angels around you, above you. If your eyes could be open, kids, teens, old people, young people, all of us, if your eyes could be opened, I think you'd be amazed at how much activity, coming and going and everything else is going on all around you that you can't see in the spirit world, which is far more real than our world is. Elisha once asked God to open the eyes of his servant because his servant was afraid because there was a big army out there surrounding the town they were in, coming after him. The whole sky, when the servant's eyes were open, was full of protective angelic armies and fiery chariots circling overhead above Elisha, invisible to the human eye. But they were very much there. Okay, brethren, we need to start to see the invisible around us, like Moses and others did in Hebrews 11:27. You can read that later. It's so exciting. When we lie down at night, we don't need to ever be afraid. We're in his care. When we wake up, our Abba has been watching over us all night long. He has his servants, our servants, his angels, watching over us every second of every day. It doesn't mean he doesn't let us go through hardships. It doesn't mean he doesn't test us with trials, even accidents and things. It doesn't mean the angels weren't on the job. But they are there, and they are watching over us. And Jesus had earlier said that those in the resurrection will be as the angels, the spirit. But it's very clear that God has made us different from angels. We're called to be his children. And Paul makes it very clear in Hebrews chapter 1 and 2, you can read those chapters later, that that offer to become children of God was never really made to angels. In the, not in the same way the, that God made it to us. They're called sons of God a couple places. But uh, they're not really angel. They're not really children of God as you and I are going to be. Now, Psalm seventeen fifteen. I'm just going to cite it or refer to it. Psalm seventeen fifteen says, "As for me, I will see your face in righteousness." Psalm seventeen fifteen. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. Now, angels are not considered brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. We are though. We're considered his real brothers and sisters. Hebrews 2 says that. And then when we're changed to spirit being, we shall be real children of God of the same kind that he is. Same kind so that Jesus can marry us. God himself gives that law implied in Genesis 1 about kind marrying its kind. And then in Genesis 1, 26 and 27... God said that he wanted to make man not after the animal kind, but as God put it, in our image, after our likeness. No animal was given that right nor offered that privilege to be in God's image or God's likeness. But you, whether you're 5 or whether you're 15 or whether you're 35 or 85, you were made in the image of God. That's why we are not of the animal kind. We're after a much higher kind, eventually the God kind. God is having children. God wants more beings like him, and yet still be part of one God. I want to take a second or two to talk about that. Because some of you hearing this will say, hey, there, there can't be more than one God. And so the Trinity was devised because it's very clearly more than one entity there in the Bible. Yet how can you have one God? So the Trinity was devised. Uh, the Bible does not teach the Trinity, but it does teach that God is one, but more than one being. Now, don't forget, in fact, in the first few verses of John chapter 1, Jesus was God in the beginning and was with God and was God. So how can you have a being who is with God and was God in the beginning and yet still have God be called one? In Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, where it says, The Lord our God is one. It's the same Hebrew word where it says one there, ekad, is used 968 times in the Old Testament and many places it includes the fact that one is referring to more than one being, including when Adam said that he and his wife were now going to be one, ekad. They were going to be one, though they were actually very definitely two separate beings. The same word that's used for God being one in Deuteronomy 6, is the same word used in Genesis 11 when God said that there were many people in Babylon, Genesis 11, 
behold, the people are one, or the people is one, as actually says it, are a cod. They're, they're so united, they're like one being. It's speaking of a profound mystery of being so like-minded that two or more people can act as one, can be one. God even said that about Babylon. And Jesus said it in John 17 in his prayer after the Passover uh, meal that he had there that he says to us that all of his disciples could become one as we are one. That's John 17, verse 22. I have it in my notes here. If you want to transcribe my notes, so read my transcript. Are you grasping the immensity of this? You can get the transcript on the web, remember. And, and you have been called to be a part of all of this. So listen very, very carefully. We have a joyful uh, future coming up ahead of us. So anyway, if we're going to be one God and, part of, and, and children of that one God, the children or offspring of anything ends up being like its parent. A baby cat is a small cat. A baby oak is a small oak, grows up to be a full oak. A baby whale is still a whale. And a child of God, when fully born, is not an angel, is not anything other than what its parent was. We will be of the God kind and part of the one God, totally united, totally in sync with God the Father. That should be hugely, hugely significant to all of you. So anyway, what does God look like? Genesis 1, 26 and 27 says we're made in his likeness. God does have a likeness. Now notice this technicality. God doesn't look like us so much as we look like God. God was here first. That's the correct way to put it. God, uh, the, we look like God rather than God looks like us. Now if you'll be turning with me to Revelation 1, we'll see a description of what Jesus looks like now because remember we're going to be like him. We're going to be like him at the resurrection. He'll have a greater brilliance than we have, because I'm sure of that, because of what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, that even the stars have different glories, and so shall it be in the resurrection. But in Revelation 1, the Apostle John, he's had a revelation, a revealing being given to him, not a hiding, but a revealing, and he sees Jesus Christ. Revelation 1, 12, one like the Son of Man, clothed to a garment down to his feet, girded about the chest with a golden band. Revelation 1.14 His head and hair were white as wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, kind of a brownish color, I guess, a, a tan, and his voice as the sound of many waters, like Niagara Falls. He had in his right hand seven stars, and so forth, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Now compare that to Daniel 12, and you'll see there in Daniel 12 that we also will be shining like, st like stars and suns. Daniel 12, verse 3, Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky, of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. <clears throat> Excuse me. Later, Jesus says in Matthew 12, I'm, so, I'm sorry, in Matthew 13, verse 43, Matthew 13, 43, I'm not turning to all these, but I'm just referring to them. You can just listen in and maybe write them down. Matthew 13, 43, the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. The righteous will shine forth as the sun. And so here earlier in Revelation said Jesus was in verse 16, Revelation 1, 16, that his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Daniel 12, uh, I mean Matthew 13, 43 says the righteous will shine forth as the sun. So God wants his kids, that's you and me, to be pretty dazzling. Modern Hollywood talk about the Oscars and how dazzling the stars of Hollywood look. A bunch of baloney compared to the kind of glory that God has coming for you and me. It's not even to be compared. So kids, young people, teenagers, imagine this. You and your parents, you and your parents can someday be as bright as the sun itself in all its brilliance. So we will look like God in his glory at that time, though God's brilliance and glory will be obviously the greatest. 
We'll feel very comfortable with one another because though we're changed to spirit beings, we'll still have legs and arms and head and hair and so forth. I hope I'll have some hair. Maybe God will restore some of mine that's been lost. He knows how many I've lost, so maybe he can put them back in there, see? Hey, by the way, God's color, what color is he? He's not white, and he's not black. He's described as fine brass colored, for whatever that's worth, uh, with dazzling white hair bright and, and, a, and a face as bright as the sun. So what can a spirit being do that we're not able to do today? What's life going to be like as a spirit being after we're changed? I know one thing, we're never going to be sick again. No more colds, no more allergies and sneezing, no more flus, no more chronic pain, no more illness of any kind. Some of you have chronic horrible pain. That's going to be a thing of the past. No more cancer, no more heart disease, no more heart attacks, no more strokes, no more Parkinson's, no more frail bones and osteoporosis, no more broken hips, no more emergency rooms. We'll never, ever, ever, ever die again. We'll never, ever get old or feel old or be old. And if we're hurting, that's all going to stop. But much more than that, God has gifted even mere flesh and blood mortals with the powers to heal. You and I will have the power to go around the world healing people. I mean, uh, ministers and others sometimes have that gift now. I wish we had more of the gift uh, to heal and, and remove tumors and blindness, crippling arthritis and aches and pains. I can hardly wait to have that kind of power to go around helping people in that way. Imagine having all the lessons of life you've learned, all the wisdom you've gained from experience and knowledge. And now being able to use it in a new, forever young spirit body that never gets tired. I can hardly wait. I know a lot of 70-year-olds feel it's a shame that youth is wasted on the young because they'd like to have the youth, I mean, the wisdom that they've gained through all these years and put it in a young body again. But whatever your age, you're going you're gonna to be empowered again. You're going to be young again. But this time with the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of love in filling your heart, the fullness of joy and peace and love for all people in all circumstances, and with all the wisdom you've gained through all the life God has given you. We're going to have fun with all of that too. I want to remind you now that the most important part is not going to be the stuff I'm talking about here. This is mostly designed, again, for kids and young people. But what will be the most fun in the end is not going to be all the power we're going to have but it's going to be the things that have changed inside of us. What we have become fully and irrevocably become, that's what's going to be so exciting in the end. Well, we'll get to that a lot more in part two. Now, so, so what is God like inside? And what will we be like inside when we're changed? God is love. It's what he is. We're going to be just like him. And we're learning to be loved now with God's Holy Spirit filling us. We have a long way to go. I know I do. But I hope we're growing in that. God is also joy personified. In fact, we're told many places that God laughs. And God is a happy God, a blessed God. He's uplifting to be around. He makes you feel good and positive when you're around Him. We're going to find Father to be fun to be around. God is peace personified. He's all the fruit of the Spirit personified. And when you and I are totally converted... I don't mean just in the theological sense, but when we're totally converted from flesh to spirit, we're going to be just like he is, inside and out. The past will be past. The weakness of flesh will be gone forever. We'll be totally new. Won't be able to be tempted by evil. We'll be loving and kind and forgiving. And we're learning to be those things now, I hope. So what will life be like, though, once we're around this fun, kind, wonderful Father we have, who will literally be with him, he'll literally be with us, a Father will get to see and enjoy time and time again. Start turning to John 20. Let's put on your, put on your seat belts now. We're about to take a fast ride down Spirit Lane. You think God's boring? Kids, you think God's boring? Listen up. You think God wouldn't enjoy a roller coaster ride or a loud, fast ride? Listen up real carefully because we're about to take a tour of spiritual hyperspace at the speed of thought or faster. Many young people are enthralled by superheroes of, imaginary, of our imaginations, the superheroes of comics, Superman, Spider-Man, Batman and Robin, Green Lantern. And When I was a kid, it was the Phantom and Tarzan and Green Lantern and all that kind of stuff. 
and all their imaginary powers. I punched in Google, wrote in superheroes. You know how many sites there are or places you could go to find out about it? 7.5 million. That means people are interested in that. If you ever wish you could be like a superhero, like a Superman, like a Spider-Man, like a Superwoman or whatever, hold on because you, you, they have nothing on God. Make sure you hear both sermons. Okay, because they have nothing on what we're going to be able to do when we're spirit, and it's not imagination. This is for real, kids. This is for real. John 20, verse 15. Why don't you turn there? Jesus has just been resurrected. Jesus, who was God and became man, died on the cross for you as well as for me, for every one of you children and teenagers and young people, as well as for all you old people and all the people in between. He's now resurrected. Mary Magdalene sees him. Mary Magdalene's trying to figure out why the tomb was empty. And, and now Jesus appears to her. And Mary finally realizes it's Jesus and wants to go hug him. Jesus says in John 20, verse 17, Don't cling to me, Mary. I have not yet ascended to my father. I have to go up there and be accepted, you see. He was the wave chief offering. But go to my brethren and say to them, my brothers and say to them. He did have brothers. I'm ascending to my Father and your Father. See, Jesus is God. Jesus' is Father is also my Father and your Father. I'm ascending to Father, to Dad, to Abba. And he's also your Abba, to my God and your God. You know, God the Father is considered God to Jesus. That's why even on the cross he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And here, even after he's res resurrected and is a divine being again, he still calls God the Father his God. Anyway, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she'd seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. And then verse 19, now remember Jesus said he had to go up to heaven and be presented to the Father. And then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, the doors are shut. It's that same day. It's now evening. Jesus came and stood in their midst. Boom, he's just right there. What does that mean? It means he came through walls, locked doors, everything. We shall be like him, folks. We're going to be able to do that too. What's a wall going to do? Nothing. When he'd said this, he showed them his hands and his sides. And then the, the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus had between that early morning and that evening gone to the Father's third heaven appeared before the Father, had been accepted by the Father, had a, no doubt a conf conference with the Father, and no doubt a great celebration. I'm sure Jesus didn't rush his time with Abba. So he, bang, got up there in heaven right away. And I know some of you are thinking they're outside of time and space. I believe they are, but time is still taken away here on earth. But when our Savior appeared on the Sea of Glass in the heavenly Jerusalem, and the temple of God his Father... As millions and millions and millions of angels stood up and applauded and probably got on their knees and bowed down in holy adoration for your big brother. And he's the big brother of all your children and teenagers and young people as well. And he's your big brother, a loving big brother. As they worshipped him, and as God conferred upon him the status of all authority and all power was given to him, there was no greater moment in the history of the universe up to that time. My point here, though, is how far did Jesus travel and how fast did he have to move? You think you're fast because you can run a 100-yard a dash in, I don't know, uh, 10 seconds or something? That'd be pretty fast. How fast did Jesus move? Did he have to move at all? I think any attempt to explain spirit travel is going to fall short of the truth and the facts. But, you know, that's the best we can do. Because we're not spirit yet. God's throne is depicted as being up in the third heaven. Paul talked about going up, being lifted up to the third heaven. But he was not allowed to tell us what he saw. No doubt this helped empower him to endure the many trials he'd seen. So God's throne is pictured as being up there 
in what's called the third heaven. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2. I'm going to turn the tape over. So all, all of you be turning your tape over. Okay, just pick it up on the side two here. Just pick it up on side two. Where our birds fly is considered a heaven also. Apparently in Genesis 1.20 it talks about the heaven. Where the birds fly and there's also a heaven where the sun is. That's probably the second heaven. So it appears that the first heavens where the birds and clouds are. Second heaven is where the sun and stars are. The, the, the galaxies and solar system. And the third heaven is apparently where God's heavenly Jerusalem is. Uh, there's no notion in the Bible for seven heavens. That's not biblical. So God's third heaven is probably beyond the stars and suns, above the billions of galaxies where God can look down and see the whole universe. And each galaxy holds trillions of stars, each. Or for you science fiction buffs, maybe, there's, maybe God's kingdom is not necessarily above all of this. Maybe it's in a totally different dimension that has no relationship to time and distance and space. Perhaps technically it's very nearby but in a different dimension. Hard to understand, unapproachable to anyone who's not a spirit being. So it could be far, far away or could be in a different dimension. Yet since his spirit fills the universe, God's aware of even a sparrow dying right down here on earth. He's certainly aware of you all the time. He's aware of when you lose a, a hair, it says. And he is, after all, Emmanuel, God with us all the time. So God is there. God is good all the time. God is there with us all the time. And though his kingdom of heaven is in the third heavens, God's kingdom that Jesus had to travel to in one day and come back that night, all in one day, that's my point here, is also depicted as being in the sides of the north of heaven. You know, the north sides of heaven, as you'll see in many places. You'll see it all written down in my transcript if you want to look it off the, take it off the web. The verses you can jot down are Psalm 48, verse 2, where it says, Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. Psalm 48, verse 2. I can't be talking about Jerusalem, because Jerusalem was in the south, not the north. Not, not physical Jerusalem, in other words. It had to be heavenly Mount Zion. <clears throat> Isaiah 14, verses 13 to 14, talking about Satan's attempt to overthrow God. Isaiah 14:13 says, You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. So that means that God's throne is something you have to ascend to, go up to. That's why I think it's above all the stars of God. I think literally the stars, above all the stars, and above all the other angels. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will make myself like the Most High. So Satan thought that he could conquer God, and this tells us that God's kingdom is above the clouds, is above, high up in the heavens, because Satan said he will have to ascend into the heavens. Now, by the way, our nearest star, Alpha Centauri, would take four years to get to. That's one way, folks. Four years traveling at the speed of light. Now, light travels, get this, at 100, if I remember my high school science, speed of light travels at 186,200 miles per second. That's why our sun, which is 93 million miles away, takes eight minutes for its light to reach us. Now, our one galaxy all by itself is so vast that if God's throne is on the edge of the galaxy, in this one galaxy, Jesus would still be traveling after these 2,000 years at the speed of light and still be nowhere close to even getting close to being close to the kingdom of God where God the Father is. And there are apparently countless galaxies, each with countless stars. So sp the speed of light is obviously way too slow. So how fast did he travel? How fast can God move? Some of you youth pride yourself in your speed. You're a fast runner. But even the fastest human can only run about 17 or 18 miles an hour. That is slow in comparison to mere animals. I suspect, hey, turn with me. Or if you want to, I'll just read it to you. But First Kings 18, 
First Kings 18 is kind of an interesting verse there. The fastest human I know of was probably Elijah under God's in inspiration and help. I suspect God supernaturally gave Elijah some extra speed right after he'd called down fire from heaven that devoured the, uh, the sacrifice. Now we know horses can run, I think it's around 40 or 45 miles an hour. Now watch this, what it says in 1 Kings 18. Right after he had killed the, the priest of Baal and, and called down fire from heaven and all that, and the rains were going to start again. 1 Kings 18, 45, 46. This was going to end the drought that was going on. 1 Kings 18, 45. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy rain. <clears throat> So Ahab rode away to Jezreel, which was 17 miles away. It's almost like a marathon. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah. So God gave him some strength. And he girded up his loins. He tucked in his, his skirt, you know. And he ran ahead of Ahab, ahead of the, of the chariot. Ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. So, I mean, that's pretty fast. That means he was running 40 miles an hour and or hour faster and uh, for 17 miles approximately, probably the fastest human ever, but it was for this one occasion under God's power. Even a jackrabbit can run 45 miles an hour, a cheetah can go 65 miles an hour. But that is slow, slow, slow compared to God, compared to angels. How fast is he? How fast is God? Well, Jesus went all the way to God's throne and had a good time with the Father and got back that night. How fast can a spirit being move? How fast will we be when we're changed to spirit? And by the way, this idea that they travel at speed of thought is not always necessarily true either. I'll give you some examples coming up here where angels traveled through space and time in some instances and some instances where there wasn't space and time. But I can hardly wait. I can barely run more than a few hundred yards without being winded. Some would even call that, a, that effort running. <laughs> But that's about to change for me and for you when I'm changed to spirit. My daughter Heather's pretty fast, but nothing like she will be. I'll race her when I'm changed to spirit, you see. And and Rachel and John, I'll race them all. You know, but in, <laughs> anyway, God can travel any way he chooses. And Ezekiel, turn with me to Ezekiel 1. Ezekiel was a prophet in captivity in Babylon, and he saw on a couple of occasions how God was traveling. And it's kind of interesting to read it. We're going to be like God. We're going to be able to to uh, see things the way God sees things and enjoy the things God enjoys and have the body and the mind and the spirit and the energy and the painlessness and the you know all of those things, I can hardly wait. Ezekiel 1 verse 4, And then I looked and behold a whirlwind was coming out of the north. Here we come again, out of the north. I think God's kingdom is up in the north there. A great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself. <laughs> And brightness was all around it, radiating out, of, radiating out of its midst, like the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. And also from within it came the likeness of four living creatures. Now these are special cherubs, cherubim. This was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Each one had four faces. Can you imagine that? Each one had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the soles of calves' feet. I'm reading Ezekiel 1. Ezekiel 1, and I'm in verse 7. They sparkled like the color of burnished bronze. The hands of a man were under their wings on their four sides, and each of the four had faces and wings. Their wings touched one another. Now this is something showing how these uh, beings are traveling. And it goes on to say they had the faces of man, lion, ox, and eagle. Let's pick up in verse 13. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. Uh, like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. Then in verse 14, And the living creatures ran back and forth in appearance like a flash of lightning. Okay, these spirit beings, when they decide to move, it's like, boom! They go right across that whole sky, and boom! They're right down there on the other end of heaven. I can hardly wait. Verse 15 describes some sort of travel device. The wheel within a wheel, fascinating stuff. We don't have time to really go into it deeply today, and I don't know that I understand it. I'll just say this. God, when he travels, can just suddenly ignore time and space and be one place or another, And but there are thousands of light years away in distance, or he can travel like lightning with four living creatures. You want wheels, kids? Teenagers, young people, young guys? A hot rod? 
You think God is so dull or boring that he wouldn't have one? No one really understand what verses 15 to the end are talking about for sure, but we know it's out of this world kind of stuff, the kind of thing George Lucas hasn't even imagined yet. It's the reason Star Wars is so exciting to millions of people is that many people would like to travel like that, would like to imagine they have powers like those things. And I'm here to tell you, Lucas has no clue what's awaiting us. Talks about the wheel within the wheel. And then in verse 20, Ezekiel 1, wherever the Spirit wanted to go, they went, because there the Spirit went. And then it talks about in the end of verse 21, the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. And the likeness of the firmament was above the heads of the living creatures, was like the color of, of an awesome crystal. And verse 24, when they went, when they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of many waters, like a Niagara Falls, like the voice of the Almighty, a tumult like the noise of an army. And when they stood still, they let down their wings, and I imagine they got quiet again. I talked to a young man not long ago. He's a full-grown adult, of course. I asked him if he could picture God riding on a big old Harley, <clears throat> a loud motorcycle. He couldn't imagine it, I guess. You think God or life as a spirit being is going to be boring? When God travels with this particular vehicle, it says it is so loud that it's like an army shouting, charging. It is so loud, it's like Niagara Falls or Victoria Falls in Africa. It is so loud that it's exciting and thrilling and God and his coming kingdom is going to be fun. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and it's too bad that I'm failing to convey it better than I should be. It's too bad that too many ministers aren't trying to convey it at all, it seems like, about what God and his family will be like when we're all spirit beings with spirit bodies. It's something we need to look forward to. Continuing on in Ezekiel 1, it talks about the appearance then of the Son of Man that he sees. In verse 27, also from the appearance of his waist and upward, I saw as it were the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around it. And from the appearance of his waist and downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire with brightness all around. Like the appearance of a rainbow and a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. You think God's dull? You think God's dull? If you do, it's because we humans have failed him. It's because we fathers and mothers have failed to convey to young people and to our old people and to all of us what God has in store for us. Here's the fun part. As part of his divine family, we will be just like him when we're resurrected. Turn now to 2 Kings 2.11, please. 2 Kings 2.11. Here Elijah is about to be semi-retired. And the time for Elisha to take over as primary prophet. If you think I'm way off in saying we could travel the same way, don't forget that even a human, the prophet Elijah, was given the ride of a lifetime. Far more exciting than any roller coaster ride. Far more exciting than a spin in a Lamborghini or a Maserati. Those are cars for, the, for you old folks. <laughs> Comic book superheroes have nothing on the spirit world and nothing on you and me when we're going to be changed to spirit. Second Kings 2.11. I hope you're there. Then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. Now we in the Bible story books we they picture Elijah going up in a chariot of fire. That's not the case. They were talking, and they see coming at them this chariot coming down from heaven on fire. And they both duck in the opposite ditches, I guess, to get out of its way. And that was God's way of separating them. And then a tornado comes, out, comes down, and that tornado is what picks up Elijah. God takes him up in a tornado, a whirlwind. That must have been fun, scary, exhilarating. A tornado from God picked up Elijah, took him to where God wanted him. He didn't rise in a fiery chariot, as all the Bible storybooks show it. He went up in a whirlwind. 
Now, what are these fiery chariots? Then Elisha, verse 17, said, Lord, open his eyes um, and let him see. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes so he could see horses of fires and chariots of fire everywhere upon the mountain. Second Kings 6, verse 17. I've jumped a whole four chapters here. And this was the story when, when the Elisha, now who had already seen this angelic fiery chariot, is now surrounded by a, a, an opposing army, and he prays to God, I mentioned it earlier already, to see, to let, his, to let his servants see what was above them. Well, they are God's protective angelic army and forces that are even about us now and above us now. Yes, you and yes, you, me. That's Second Kings 6, 17 I just read. You need to also open your eyes and see what's in fact all around you. When Peter had tried to defend Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, what did Jesus say? He said, God, do you not think that I could ask my father and right now he could send legions of angels now, stat, instantly, from heaven? Or maybe they're even right here now already. We just don't see them. And if they're not here and have to come from heaven, don't you think they can travel so fast that they can be here, stat, right now? Matthew 26, verse 53. Getting excited yet? Have any of you ever ridden on a spirited racehorse? If you haven't, what a thrill that is. I know Heather got on one one time. We were all riding horses on the beach one time, and somehow she got this old racehorse, I mean a retired racehorse that decided to be a racehorse again, and it just took off down the beach. And and uh, what a ride. Not It wasn't just a, uh, a trail horse. Or maybe you've been on a big old plodding Clydesdale. I think that would be exhilarating. Does God enjoy a powerful mount to ride? Now turn with me to 2 Samuel 22. Please turn there. 2 Samuel 22, verse 10 and 11. For those of you who think God's boring, first, 2 Samuel 22, verse 10 and 11. This is only the beginning. The second sermon is going to really go into some fun stuff. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and flew, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. Now, a cherub has four wings. They're brilliant, intelligent beings who stand before God, powerful beyond description, awesome beyond understanding, and fast, very fast, and loud, very loud when they move, very dramatic. When those cherubs or cherubim fly, Ezekiel 10.5 says they're like thunder. They're like God's voice. Ezekiel 10.5, they're very loud. They're like lightning flashing across the heavens as they travel. Get this, brethren. God races his angels. Don't you think God has races? Why do you think we have races? Who do you think put those thoughts in us? Come on. When God races his angels and his chariots, when they have angel games, if you will, the skies light up with power and lightning as they charge across the skies. You like NASCAR? You like Indy 500? You ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. These are the same cherubs before his throne. We know two of them by name, Michael and Gabriel. The same two cherub who guarded the entrance to the Garden of Eden when God booted out our father and mother Adam and Eve. Genesis 3, at the end of it, you read that. The depiction of these two special cherubs were on the Ark of the Tabernacle over the mercy seat. And the Ark simply pictured the reality of our God who dwells between the cherubim. All my scriptures, scriptural references are in my notes. You can get off the web. Again, they're described in Ezekiel 10 if you want to take the time to read it. Daniel 9.23 says, Gabriel came flying to Daniel swiftly. The same cherub who says he stands in the presence of God who appeared to the father of John the Baptist and to Mary the mother of Jesus who could fly swiftly. You think you're going to miss your car? You think you're going to miss your wheels in the resurrection? I don't care if you have a $500 bucket of bolts or Lamborghini. It won't matter compared to what God is going to give for us. Turn with me to Psalm 68, verse 17. Psalm 68, verse 17. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of thousands. God doesn't have just a stable of one horse or, or, or a garage of one or two cars. The chariots of God are 20,000 and thousands of thousands. 
The Lord is among them as in Sinai. And then in Psalm 104, verses 3 and 4. Psalm 104, verses 3 and 4. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters, who makes the clouds his chariot, who walks on the wings of the wind, who makes his angels spirits, and his servants, or ministers, a flame of fire. Does that sound like a boring being? Hey, fellas, we haven't even begun to live yet. Mind has not even conceived yet what God has in store for us. God is good all the time. God's kingdom is going to be fun and happy, exciting, wonderful place. When Jesus returns, he's pictured as being on a white charger. In fact, all of us who return with Christ will be on fine white chargers. Even you kids who by then may be well be turned into spirit beings too. You can read that in Revelation 19, verses 11 to 14. It says all that are with him will be on white chargers. Those aren't flesh and blood horses. No way. Flesh and blood can't abide uh, the third heaven. Flesh and blood can't be in the kingdom. Those must be angelic beings that we're going to be riding. Super intelligent beings that look like horses. Heaven and God's kingdom is going to be a very familiar looking place to us. We're going to feel very much at home. I believe for a long time, as many have, that many of the angels are the reality of the animal kingdom we now see. They are the powerful and intelligent Beings that look like horses, cats, dogs, eagles, sparrows, tigers, lions, you name it. There's an angelic being that is the reality of the animal world we see today. Star Wars movies showing beings that look weird and odd. That's not the truth. The truth is we're going to feel very much at home in God's kingdom. Let's continue learning how they travel. Sometimes through space, sometimes not. In Acts 8, if you turn with me there. In Acts 8, verses 38 to 40, this is when Philip was speaking and preaching and teaching the uh, Ethiopian, excuse me, the Ethiopian eunuch. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. You got that? Here's a human being that suddenly disappeared. The Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus. Azotus was uh, the Ashdod of the Old Testament. is about 34 miles away. So apparently, when it comes time to flee, you and I won't have to worry if our, if our car runs out of gas or, or if something happens. If God wants us to be someplace, the Spirit of God can just take us and make us appear there wherever, whenever he wants to. We don't have to worry about things like that. You know the time that Jesus walked on water? Turn to John 6 now. John 6, verse 16 to 21. John 6, verses 16 to 21. When Jesus walked on water and then got in the boat, turn to John 6 because there's a little verse here that I think most of God's children read right over. It says, When evening came, John 6:16, 6, His disciples went down to the sea and, and got into the boat and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose and, and uh, because of a great wind was blowing. And then they saw Jesus walking on the sea. Verse 19, drawing near the boat, they were afraid. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they, were willingly received, then they willingly received him into the boat. John 6, 21 is a verse I want you to really focus on. I want you to see it with your own eyes. Then they willingly received him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. Here they are in the middle of a boisterous lake, a big lake. Jesus gets in the boat, and without any knowledge of traversing time or space, they went from being in the middle of the lake to being on the land. And no knowledge of the travel in between. That's the way I read it. Immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. Did you get that? Somehow the boat did not even go through time and space, just suddenly appears at the land. You and I are going to be able to travel like that. After Jesus' resurrection, turn to Luke 24, he appears and vanishes at will. We'll be able to do that. Kids, children, teenagers, this is going to be fun. Do you want to miss it? Do you want to possibly get involved with the sins 
and the weaknesses and the temptations and the wooden nickels of this world and give up the awesome wonders and treasures and pleasures that God has in store for you, I hope you are beginning to understand there is an awesome future. That's why the Bible says that when people see what they've given up because of giving in to sin, giving in to this world, giving up on God, that it says they will, they will have wailing and gnashing of teeth. There's a story of Gabriel, of course, trying to get to Daniel, but was stopped by angels of the bad kind. In fact, let's go there first. Let's read that. Here it clearly shows an angel traveling through space and then being stopped, traveling from God's throne room to Daniel and being stopped. But prior to that, let's go to Daniel 9, verse 20 and 21. Daniel, uh, while I was speaking, praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, Daniel 9, verse 21, while he was praying, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reach me about the time of the evening offering. Then in chapter 10 of Daniel, on the 24th day of the first month, I was standing beside the great Tigris River, and I looked up and I saw a man dressed in linen clothing with a belt of pure gold around his waist. His body looked like a dazzling gem. From his face came light, flashes like lightning, and his, I'm in Daniel 10, verse 6, and his eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and feet shone like polished bronze, and his voice was like the roaring of a vast multitude of people. And he said to me, I'm, I'm jumping to verse 12, don't be, don't, Do not fear, Daniel. From the first day you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I've come because of your words. So God sent him from God's throne room, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia, this is a powerful demonic being who was in charge of Persia. Remember, Satan is the god of this world. He's the ruler of this age. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. I couldn't come get through to you. I got that far and could go no further. But behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I'd been left there alone with the kings of Persia. Referring to the evil, fallen, demonic powers. And then if you jump ahead to verse 20 and 21. At the end of telling Daniel what he had to tell him, he says to him, Do you know why I've come to you? And now I must return to fight the prince of Persia. And when I've gone forth, even the prince of Greece will come and try to help this king of Persia. But I'll tell you what's noted in Scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. So they can move mightily, powerfully, swiftly, and appear and disappear. And so will we be able to. We can read how Jesus walked with his twelve, uh, two, uh, two disciples in Luke 24, verse 28 to 31, and then vanishes from their sight. Luke 24, 28 to 31. And now continuing in verse 36 of Luke 24. Luke 24, verse 36. Now as he said these things, Jesus stood suddenly in their midst, said, Peace be unto you. They were terrified. They thought they were looking at a spirit. Jesus said, Look, so I, I, basically he was a spirit. But a spirit can, can look very flesh and blood-like, can look like they have uh, uh, skin and bones and all that. They said, Behold my hands and my feet. And they had him touch him and everything. Then he asked for some food. He ate the food, and it didn't just plop on the floor. It really did go in. <laughs> so they gave him a piece of broiled fish, some honeycomb, and he took it and ate in their presence. And we're going to be able to eat and drink as spirit beings. Uh, we're going to eat and drink at the table of Jesus Christ when he raises the, uh, the toast to the kingdom and drinks of the wine again, drinks of the final cup that he left on the table. Go back and hear my sermon on the new look at the fresh look of the emblems. Continuing in verse 50, and he led them far out as Bethany. He lifted up his hands and blessed them. I'm in Luke 24, verse 50. Verse 51, now it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. We're going to be able to rise up into heaven also. We're going to be able to fly swiftly like the angels. We're going to be able to go in and out of doors and windows and walls. You know, when you look at a wall, when a spirit being looks at a wall, there's more that is not there than what is there. If you took the whole earth 
and t took all the space out of the earth. They, they say that it would come down to the size of a dot, very heavy dot. Size of a dot. So when spirit beings look at a wall, they see lots and lots and lots of space to get through. I can't wait. And we're just getting started. The most fun part is yet to come. So be sure to hear part two where we'll learn all about the lot more incredible powers that we'll have as spirit beings, what they can see, and how they see. You're going to be amazed by that. How they can hear and what they hear, how far they can hear, how strong they are, how fast they are, how powerfully awesome they are. I say they, that's going to be us someday. And then what they're like inside. We're going to talk a lot about that because in the end, the most important part and the most fun part of all is knowing you will never sin again. Knowing you'll never make a mistake again. Knowing you'll never say the wrong thing again. Knowing you'll never hurt anybody again in a wrong way. Even with all the power we'll have, we'll be full of self-control. But we're going to have some fun. We're going to have some fun, and I can hardly wait. Most importantly, kids, young people, old people, all of you, don't ever, ever give this up. Don't be like, don't be like uh, Esau, who sold up his birthright for a bowl of lentils. What's your bowl of lentils? What are you prepared to give this up for? Working on the Sabbath? Sex with that hot chick that you see in school? Chance to get drunk? Away from your parents? What are you going to give this up for? It's not worth it, is it? Whatever age you are, I'm not picking on anybody here. And we've all done stupid, stupid, stupid things, and I have too. How I've repented. And I hope you have too. Don't go for the cheap stuff Satan offers you, the fake stuff he offers, the temporary pleasures of sin. Don't sell out your incredible destiny. If you'll just believe and wait for part two and turn to God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might, ask him to help you see what he has in store for you. Ask him to help you get excited about it. Then thank God with all your being that this is yours if you will just endure to the end and claim what is yours and accept Jesus as your Savior and walk with him and talk with him and never, ever, ever let him go or, or his promises that he's given you. Never, ever let those go. That's all for now. And uh, we'll finish this next time. God be with you.